Good evening. My name is Amira, and I serve with our youth and on our connections team. Um, and our teaching text today is from Psalm 63, and it reads, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. Those who want to kill me will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword and become food for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by God will glory in him, while, in, while the mouths of liars will be silenced. This is the word of the Lord. I became a follower of Jesus the weekend I turned 17, and it was in the middle of a youth revival. And I don't know what comes to mind when you hear the term revival, but this was just an extraordinary season of an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the services would last three, four hours. Uh, they were carrying people out to their cars because they were so overwhelmed with the power of God. You didn't go to church because you had friends there and you liked the Bible teaching and the worship was good. You went to church because you had no idea what the living God who was present was going to do. I have tried to, for almost 30 years, take the best of what I experienced there, keep that fire in my heart, steward it, and add to it over the course of time. Trying to figure out what happened to me. What were the conditions that enabled so much of the power of God to rush in and to seize the hearts of so many young people has been one of the great quests of my adult life. I've spent decades researching, reading about, praying, studying, and traveling to think about revival. And a lot of people have tried to figure out how you can see an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So this, everybody's trying to come up with these explanations. Calvinists, people who have Reformed theology, tend to have a very high view of God, a ton of respect, the fear of the Lord. A uh, high view of God's word, a lot of respect. You'll you very, very rarely find a liberal Calvinist. And they believe that one of the reasons that God blesses certain Calvinist congregations is because of their high view of God in the scripture. And you go back through church history, it's true. Some of the greatest revivals that have happened, that have happened, have happened under the influence of Calvinist leaders. But then you get Arminians who believe not quite the opposite, but almost the opposite of what uh, Calvinists believe about how salvation happens. And they don't believe in the, the, the sovereign purposes and uh, meticulous decrees of God. They believe that humans have a say in it. They believe there's human agency that determines the outcomes. And quite often Arminians say, well, the reason outpourings happen with us is because in our freedom we choose to have God among us. And then you get Anglicans and high church people. These are folks who are very liturgical, you know, so it's like proper church, high church, very regulated, uh, a lot of tradition, a lot of historic elements. And they're like, well, obviously God uses us because we've preserved beauty in a decaying society. And it's true, there's been some amazing high church people who have experienced the moves of God. But then you get Anabaptists who are very, very low church, like super cash. Are you, and then you, you get non-denominational folks like in the Jesus movement. And that was not high church. And, uh, and yet they're having these massive outpourings. And so everybody seems to think it's their distinctive. And yet everybody who doesn't have those distinctives experiences the same thing. And so it made me think there's got to be some deeper principle underneath this. 
that is true about all of these communities in, instead of their distinctives, that is one of the real reasons. And so in order to sort of investigate this further, uh, I took my family in 2018 on what we just called the Titan Revival Tour. And uh, so in the summer, we visited 17 locations around the world where uh, many of the greatest outpourings of human history, have hap- uh, of the Holy Spirit in history have happened. And this was a, a wonderful, wonderful time. Some of the most life-giving, profound encounters I've ever had happened on that trip. And when I came back, everyone was like, yo, JT, did you find it? Did that trip, what'd you learn? Did you find the secret? And here's what I said. Yeah, I did. Like, really? Yeah, yeah, I found it. Like, what is it? Do you really want to know? Lean in, I'll tell you. So here's the secret. It's quite simple. I'll say it to you in one sentence. God comes where he's wanted. Hunger is the secret. And when a Calvinist or an Arminian or a high church or a low church gets hungry, God shows up. God comes where he's wanted. The reason God shows up in, and and this makes so much sense of what happens. There's obviously a sovereign element. God does what he wants. But you look at uh, the revival in the Hebrides. Let me tell you, we're, we're going to have the pastor, a pastor from the Hebrides here in three weeks, bringing him over. It's so hard to get to the Hebrides. It's like, if I can think of the least strategic place in Scotland for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, I would be like, yeah, number one, the Hebrides. The outer Hebrides would be the least. Why on earth does a manifestation of the presence of God where there's the tangible zones of the presence of God where people would walk into it and they'd fall into trances, be overcome with the presence of God for days. That have, service, that have services where people were so convicted of their sins that they'd sit there under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and they were crying out that they couldn't stop them. They would literally just like leave the church and go home and leave the people crying out they'd be there all night. No one would have even known about this. This would have happened complete in their local community, except somebody started telling false stories about it and they felt like they had to defend the integrity of God. Why not Glasgow? Why not one of the big cities in Scotland? Well, here's the answer. I didn't want him as much there. I wanted him in the Hebrides. Hunger attracts the presence and power of God. So folks, if you want to know the key to seeing an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, God comes where he's wanted. I don't think I can add much more than that. That's it. it. (laughs) Now, here's the problem, okay? Here's the problem. But that's not bad. I want you to hold that in your spirit. God will bypass a thousand lukewarm hearts to ignite the one heart who's hungry. Hunger is a principle of the presence of God. But here's the challenge we have as a church. What do you do if you're not hungry? Or what do you do if your hunger has waned? Or what do you do if you're struggling with your circumstances? What do you do if you're so overwhelmed with the stuff you're dealing with right now that the idea of a move of God feels like a luxury, not a necessity? And that's what I want to talk about tonight because I think this is a key behind the key. How do you cultivate spiritual hunger and thirst? So tonight, David is going to teach us about how to do this. And he's gonna do this from Psalm 63, one of the most beautiful Psalms in the scripture. So I wanna pull out a few points that we see from David's hunger for God that I think are very, very instructive for us tonight about how to cultivate spiritual hunger. So let's jump in here, verse one. Here's the, the first key. The gap is the gift. Write that down, the gap is the gift. Look at verse one. You God, my God, Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I've seen you in the sanctuary and I've beheld your power and your glory. Now, I don't know what you're thinking when you hear that passage. That's King David. That's poetic, isn't it? My whole being longs for you, God. I see King David early in his palace with a kingly robe and an Americano, if they were doing it back then. And he's sitting there and he's like, "Uh, host, please, a scroll, I'm inspired. 
I believe Psalm 63 is coming upon me and I want to get it. God, thou art my God. I will seek thee with my whole heart. This is what we tend to think. This is an artist, and he's doing his craft. But I, I, did you notice the inscription at the top of Psalm 63? Look at what it says here. A Psalm of David when he was in the desert of Judah. Now, most scholars believe that what's happening here is David is writing this when his son has rebelled against him and has stolen his kingdom, and David has had to flee for his life, and he is hiding in the wilderness. Not exactly poetic. Imagine, if you will, a New York multi-generational family dynasty. Say they're in magazines, okay? And they're in a, there's a huge dynasty, and the son wants to overthrow the father, and it works. And so the dad has to flee the city, gets on a plane, just make not southwest, gets on a plane, gets out of the city, ends up at a Motel 6 in Wisconsin, and is just like hating his life. Pulls out an old iPad, not even an iPad Pro, an an older iPad. And just looking around and is like, what has happened to my family, to my legacy, to my resources? But sitting down on that Motel 6, taps out with his fingers, God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you, I thirst for you. And I want you to see this. This is very, very important because quite often the painful circumstances are the first gift to stir up hunger within us. I've had an amazing life. My life has just been wild. I never saw it coming, to be honest with you. It's been painful, though. A lot of very, very hard things I've dealt with over the years. And uh, here's what I've learned with the high times and the low low times. The good times teach you nothing. No, I love them. Look at me. I love a good time. But they don't teach you anything. They're enjoyable. They're great but they're rarely formative. The desperation, the growth, the lessons are in the pain and in the struggle. And sometimes when when we get complacent, when we're not hungry, when we get lukewarm, God will change the circumstances and put us in positions where we start learning the key of hunger. He'll put us in places where we have to start crying out. That gap between what we wish God would do and who he is and what we experience will become his sovereign curriculum to teach us about spiritual hunger. And some of you think, oh, I'd be so much more hungry for God if my life was easier. No, you wouldn't. You might be a little more grateful, but you won't be more hungry. That desperation for change, that desperation to see something different happen, that's one of the very things God uses to stir hunger within us. And that's why if you're going to be a disciple in the modern West, you have to choose hardship in following Jesus. You have to consciously structure your life in the wilderness and get away from so much of the pleasure of the world in order just to be hungry again. The gap is the gift for us. That's why the Bible says in the Beatitudes, blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the poor in spirit. It's the ones who are needy and hungry and desperate. They're the ones that are close to the kingdom, not to the ones who are fully satisfied. So I want you to see this. David's hunger for God is birthed out of painful experiences. God can stir hunger wherever you are or whatever you're going through. Second thing, you have to understand, examine, and seek full fulfillment for all of your longings. If you're going to cultivate desire and spiritual passion... You have to interrogate and investigate what it is that you want. Now, we, it's very, very hard to figure out what you want. Man, this is not a bad question to ask. You know that when people come to Jesus, one of the questions he says again and again and again is this, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus has got a blind bloke and he says to him, do you want to see? Like, no, I'm good. Of course he wants to see. Why did Jesus ask him to test what's in his heart? And so there's nothing wrong with examining our desires. This is what David says about desire. Listen to these words. They're kind of startling. Verse 3, because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. Don't, Don't rush past that. Because your love is better than life. Whoa. 
How many of you are like, why did you become a, how about this one? Come to Alpha where you will discover that his love is better than life. Come, your love is better than life. This is David's experience of walking with God. Now I've lost my notes. Then he goes, he goes on and he says this, verse four, I will praise you as long as I live and in your name I will lift up my hands. Verse five, I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. You know, over the holidays, and like you know, whoever does the cooking and, and wherever you were, it's like, ladies and gentlemen, what we've got for you up first, we've got some entrees. You're like, ooh. And I've got, we've got some snacky snacks. You're like, yeah. And then we've got all these special things. And by the, the seven courses, and by the last one, you're like, I might have sinned, but bless God, forgive me. That was glorious. You're just like, you cut, you're like, I got a nap. I got like, does everyone agree we must sleep this off? I'm in a food coma. That kind of fullness, David says, is what happens when your longings are routed into the love of God. There's a kind of fullness. See, the Bible teaches that we are creatures of desire. We're not brains on a stick. We're creatures of desire. We are one physical body carrying around a ball of longing. And this is what makes us who we are. But the challenge is we live in a world where it's so easy to take our longings and come and give them to what John of the Cross calls false attachments. And a false attachment is where you take that hunger of your, your heart and you put it onto a person. Perhaps you're single and young man and you're trying to date a woman and you make this woman will be my Eve. And you endow her with all the beauty and intensity of half of the human race. You're, like, you're not crushing or smothering her. It's totally appropriate, okay? <laughs> you're just, and you're just like... Whew. I remember once, I remember, I remember this once extraordinary meeting I had many, 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 many years ago. The early 2000s. And... Uh, it was with a non-Christian who was dating a Christian in our church and the non-Christian wanted to know if they could meet with a pastor. And I was like, I gotta take this one. I gotta take this one, okay? And he said, you, I think she's committing idolatry. I said, what? She's turned me into her God and I can't be her God and I need you to tell her that as her pastor. I was like, we're having ourselves a self-aware little, little conversation right here. And I just thought, I wonder if people see it like that. False attachments, this could happen in your career. This will give me everything. There's so many things that we attach ourselves to that we get obsessed with. And when we route these longings through the wrong thing, they fail us every time, eventually. But it's tempting in a world like ours. It's tempting in a city like ours. The prodigal son, when he left home, thought, these losers don't know anything. But when he was in that pig slop, he goes, ah, oh, maybe there was something to what they said. But when he was cashed up, partying in Vegas, nobody could tell him. But eventually, it runs out. This is what Jeremiah 2 says. This is God's critique of his people through the prophet. Be appalled at this, you heavens. Shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. My people have committed two sins. They've forsaken me, the spring of living water, and they've dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. That's the challenge. They can't hold water. There's a thirst in you. There's a hunger in you. There's a desire in you so deep that no person or no job or no amount of recognition or no amount of credibility or no matter how much you prove them wrong and show them, it'll ever be enough when you go into the depths of your heart to satisfy you. And it is such a disorienting moment where you've built a well inside of you. I don't need God, I don't need anybody else. I'm gonna do this. And you go inward and there's nothing there. It's so fascinating this past week, Demar Hamlin uh, got hit uh, playing football and maybe he died on the field and was resuscitated. 
But out of nowhere, this just sort of like took over the U.S. Did you see this? Just it was, it was everywhere. And I was like, man, it's, it's not, not just the conversation about the safety and football and all the other stuff. The most extraordinary thing was like the amount of people who prayed. Did you see this? You see that beautiful scene where the commentator doesn't know what to do and so just prays? And no one was like, get, get prayer out of here. The ACU was like, we need separation. Everyone was just like, we got nothing else to do, man. Will you thank you? It was actually a really heartfelt prayer. But one of the things that stood out to me, Nick Wright, who was another commentator on television, said this, it made me a little envious in that moment. And since then, that I didn't have that foundation. This is as an atheist or some sort of higher purpose or something. Because in the face of that explicable tragedy, I'm kind of flailing. And that's like, okay, that was a rare moment when our culture in the midst of its obsession with sports and celebrities and everything that goes with it realized that the well it had dug of meaning was bankrupt. God's heart for you is to be fully satisfied in his love. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. The love, so what is this? I mean, that's a big claim, isn't it? Your love is better than life. Here's your boy David. He's in the wilderness. His son's rebelled against him. He's lost everything. And he's like, but actually I haven't lost that much because there's a well of love in me. What sort of love is that? Do you know that love? Because that's what the love is that you're invited into. This word hesed, hesed love. Every now and then you meet someone who's like super Pentecostal and they name their kids hesed. <laughs> and I want to tell you right now, if I had another daughter, she would be hesed, facts. <laughs> hesed is a hard word to translate. It appears almost 450 times in the Old Testament. And in various versions, it appears as kindness, Mercy, goodness, loyalty, faithfulness. But then they realize, oh, that's not quite getting to the intensity and depth of it. So they start mashing words together. You get combinations like steadfast love, faithful love, loyal love. But most scholars agree that the best translation is loving kindness. And when God reveals himself in, when, to the Israelites when they're in slavery, and Moses is like, who am I even going to tell them? One of the things God says is, tell them that this is what I'm like. I am a God full of loving kindness. Now, think about these two words, loving kindness. One of the things that happens in human relationships, you go through a period where your body produces three chemicals and you are like literally addicted to a person like their heroin. It's quite a strong attraction. And so in those early months, you're like, oh my God, like they can just do no wrong. I mean, it's just like, it's just the best thing ever. Over time, that wears off and you have to, not for Christy and I, 25 years in, baby. <laughs> Nothing but bliss and glory. Um, for others, those poor, timid souls. <laughs> so what happens is that wears off for others. And here's what you realize. They're just people. And they've got drama. And they've got wounds from other relationships. And they've got family of origin issues. And they can be selfish. They can be unfaithful. They can have disordered loves inside of them. There can be a chaotic world behind that attraction you had to them. And the level of disappointment, that, because here's the thing, the reason people idolize romantic relationships is because it's the closest thing that we have to the divine. And it's almost there, but never enough. And do you know how absolutely devastating it is when those chemical wear off and you just sit and they're going like, crap, I married a sinner. Like they're not going to fix me. And you're still lying in bed. And no matter how much intimacy is there or how much glorious sex is there or how much Instagram worthy stuff you've been able to accumulate together, you're lying there and the longings aren't filled in your heart. That's the ultimate loneliness. But you know, the love of God, the more you know him, the more time you spend with him, the more you understand him, rather than ever being disappointed in who he is, you're just more amazed at his loving kindness day after day. 
I've been a Christian almost 30 years, and I felt like in my early 20s, like, no, I really know the Lord. And now I'm like, I am swimming in a thimble of the love of God, and an ocean is available to me. And all I'm trying to do is like climb the wall of the thimble to get more. That's the beauty of a relationship with God. It's a never-ending source of loving kindness. David was a king. David had a lot of sex in his life. Look at his legacy. And here's what David says. Your loving kindness is better than that. David's a king. He has power. And you know what he says? Your loving kindness is better than power. And David has notoriety. Remember what they said about Saul? Saul has slain his thousands. David, his tens of thousands. He has a meteorite rise. He says, your love is better than recognition from humans. Your loving kindness. I, I want to say to you tonight, some of you, you're, 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 you're like, man, I don't know if I can love God with all my heart because I've been hurt. His loving kindness will heal you. But I've just been betrayed. His loving kindness will do things, will give you the grace to forgive. It is, in, it is in taking all of these things and routing them through him that you find the resources you need for life. Your love is better than life. And so much of what it is to cultivate to desire is to learn to delight in God's satisfying love. Learning how to delight in it. Look at Psalm 36. This is another beautiful passage. How priceless is your unfailing love, O oh God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. How many of you, I, I don't think New York knows that when you say you're a Christian, that this is what you're talking about. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Continue your love to those who know you, your righteousness to the upright in heart. Do you remember uh, George Mueller? I've, I've referenced this before. George Mueller was, uh, he was in Bristol in the UK and he started an orphanage, fed thousands and thousands of kids. Beautiful, beautiful ministry. And uh, he lived completely by faith. So they'd have no food, and he'd be like, well, Lord, you're up. And then someone would knock at the door, and they'd be like, we felt like we were meant to feed the oil. You know, it was just a wild story of faith. And everyone was like, what's the, mo what's the secret of faith? And here's what he said. The chief duty of the Christian is to make their hearts glad in the Lord first thing of the day. Well, it's not like fast and listen to like people praying in tongues. It's not to like, no, I mean, you're going to make your heart happy in God. I think that's where a lot of us get wrong. How many of you are like, hey, you want to come over tonight? Oh, I can't, mate. I'm marinating my heart in the love of God. <laughs> so I'm not going to be able to make that. What a concept. People often say to me, like, when do you spend time with God? It's super intense. And I'm like, well, it depends. I, I, do, I do intercessory prayer at night, and that can get intense. That get, can get rowdy. But not abiding. Like in the mornings, here's what I'll do. I'll take a, always the Gospels. Never leave the Gospels. Always Jesus. All Scriptures God breathe. I love the whole thing. I'm not a red-letter Christian, but always the Gospels. <laughs> I'll take a little section, and here's what I'll just do. Ready? I'll read a few. So I, I did it with this, Psalm 63. Because your love is better than life. And I'll just be like, what a claim. Is it really? And I'll start thinking about all the things life offers. Like how much travel is available. How much money is available. Your love is better than this. And then I'll just say, Lord, please give me an encounter with your love. I'll just be right here waiting. I'm still I was drinking in your love, God. I need to show this generation that's alive right now that you can be more satisfied with your love than people could be satisfied with anything else. Lord, so please come on, pour out your love. I'll just wait there. And then I'll read the next verse. Uh, because you were my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. Oh, maybe I should sing. I'm going to sing a bit. And I'll just sing a bit. And it's like there's no pressure. When people say, I meditate, I'm like, what on earth do you think about? 
Because Christian meditation, meditation is totally different. It's about filling your mind with the beauty of God. The world has to empty its mind because it's so full of chaos, but Christians fill their mind the beauty of God. So it's, it's, not, it's just like receiving the Father's love, meditating on the truth, thinking about this, chewing on this, no chewing aloud, meditating on this, sitting with this so deeply. And I will often find at the end of this, I am walking around going, involuntary sighs of gratitude, like, oh my gosh. Like, <sighs> Chris like, you all right? I'm like, I don't know if I'm all right. You read Psalm 63. And I'm just letting it hit me afresh. And I've been doing that for 30 years. And we have to prioritize and delighting in the love of God. I think we get so busy to get to prayer. We're so busy to get to our day. We're so busy to get to our concerns. That the reason our hearts are light and thin is because we're just not spending enough time in his presence. My goal is to normalize people having spiritual passion and enjoying the love of God. I want to normalize it. It needs to be a practice that we cultivate. Jesus was full of life. He was full of passion. We've got, we've got Jesus walking around, and maybe it's because when Hollywood started, this is the only way they could make movies, but Jesus is like in a bad bathrobe, and he's walking around teaching in a, in a high-pitched voice. This is not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Bible is is turning over tables and making a whip and clearing the temple. I want you to imagine being in the temple. Jesus comes in, he's like, this ain't it. And just like everyone's like, oh my gosh. And what does it say? Zeal for my house will consume me. Jesus was a man consumed with zeal. Jesus sees his friend die. What does he do? He weeps. Jesus is not there as some stoic teacher of moral principles. He's a man fully alive, looking at the beauty of God in the world and the brokenness of sin in the world and doing something about it. Well, who is the Holy Spirit? One of the things is that the Holy Spirit's a gentleman. Can I just, that's, when I was in the Pentecostal church, the Holy Spirit's a gentleman. And you know what I want to say to that? Show me that in the Bible. That's like some crap Pentecostal phrase that's not true. The Holy Spirit is a wind and a fire. The day of Pentecost, it was, excuse me, folks, if it's not, excuse me, I'd like to pour fire on you for a Pentecost. <laughs> fire. The building is shaking. God was in charge of the encounter. The father, the father's not like the, the prodigal son. He's like, uh-uh, uh-uh, you stink. Go have a shower and we'll talk about how you're going to pay me back. What does the father do? Pulls up his robe, runs down the road. It's a heart of love. And I just want our passion to match the passion of the God that we serve. I just want to, I just want to look like Jesus, undomesticated, fully emotionally alive, passionate and filled with zeal. I want to have the power of the Holy Spirit blowing and burning through me. I want the love of the Father to make me lift up my life and run to things that scare other people. Remember, the invitation is to become all flame. It's not to develop a little cute rule of life where you've got wonderful boundaries and you just do your thing and it's all sustainable. Jesus is going to put a wrecking ball through your sustainability with the wild love of God. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this, opposition to what is called enthusiasm can be one of the greatest hindrances to revival. And it is the particular danger of people who are in a state of dead orthodoxy. Sticking with the British, C.S. Lewis says this, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when, what, when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because we cannot imagine what's meant by the offer of a holiday of the sea. We're far too easily pleased. This morning I met somebody who comes up to me, rolls up her sleeve, and she has a wave tattooed on her forearm. And she says, that's that Lewis quote for me. I'm headed to the sea. 
I was like, heck yes, you are. <laughs> I've been studying the psychology of ambition over the break. And one of the nicest little summaries I came across was this. Three ways of motivation. I will, I won't, and I want. I will is that sort of self-will, like 2023, this is gonna be a breakthrough year, say it after me. I will, I will, I can, I can. And I did. And you've got, I won't, say it after me, I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't. I did, I did. But the key to really build something is I want. It's to cultivate hunger and it's to cultivate passion. Passion will trump discipline. Sorry, passion will trump human effort long after it wears off. Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus, I want to just tell you that the thing, that longing that you have that brought you to this city, that passion to do something with your life, I want you to know I affirm that. I love that. Every city has its dysfunction, but I would rather take the dysfunction of ambition than the apathy of somewhere else. This is my kind of dysfunction, you know? But I want to say this to you. The frustration you're having with it will be removed when you connect it to the right source. That's why Isaiah 55 says, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Here's Jesus' invitation to you. Come and find out that the Hesed love I have for you is better than any love or any position or any accomplishment this city has got for you. Come and find out. And our church is trying to host a living experiment right now on proving to New York City that the love of God is better than what this city has to offer. And the experiment is working. Now, practically, practically, how do you, so you're like, thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Psalm 63 was strong, okay? A lot going on in there, and I appreciate what you've learned from your time in the wilderness and the Hesed love of God, okay? But how do you live this out? So I want to give you three practical things to begin to cultivate this desire. Number one, you've got to get near the flame. If you hang around with cynical, lukewarm people, guess what you'll become? Sociologically, you know, I mean, this is all mimetic desire. There's so much in here. But you basically take on the values and traits of most of the people that you hang around. And so if you want to be around passion, get around people who really love God. That's why we say all the time, hey, we want you to come to the prayer room. It's not, it's not that this, the prayer room is a magic room. This is not Narnia when you come through those doors into a wonderland of glory. It's not like that. It's just that the chance of you staying at home and watching something on TV that will cultivate fear, pride, or lust, numb your spiritual passion, and then create cynicism in your heart is very high. And the chance of that happening when you're in the prayer room is very low. So get in a better environment and see if something doesn't change. There's so many times I have come to the prayer room when I have been so unmotivated. Like, oh my gosh. Ugh. And then there'll be a fire at the front and one of the, it'll shoot out and a spark will hit my heart and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm caught up. This happened on New Year's Eve. I was so tired on New Year's Eve. I was saying to Christy, I'm so tired. I gotta go pray all night. I've gotta go cultivate and model hunger for God. And I'm telling you, I'm four minutes in and I'm like, glory, 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 glory. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. The whole thing is here. I, mean, I wasn't feeling that when I walked in. I was like, oh gosh, it's bad coffee. Not even good coffee. Four minutes later, glory, raise the temple gates. It was the faith of the room that carried me. Number two, get around young people. Warm your heart and the passion of the young. Thoreau said this, the youth get together, the youth gather, sorry, the youth gets together his materials to build a bridge to the moon 
or perchance a palace or a temple on the earth. And at length, the middle-aged man concludes to build a woodshed with them. One of the things that happens as you age, people tell me, is uh, you start getting... (laughs) You start getting cynical. In your life, all of those passions, you're like, man, that was just naive. And that's not realistic. And you look at young people and you're like, life will beat that joy out of you. Trust me. (laughs) Trust me. You get to be like me when you grow up. got to get around the young. And uh, there's something beautiful about getting around someone who's just become a Christian and is reading for the Gospels for the first time. And they're like, oh, Pastor John, I've got to meet with you. I've got to meet with you. Okay? I've got a verse, and I have to share it with you. The Lord's put it on my heart, I have to share it with you. Okay, great, was it? Have you read John 3.16? <laughs> Listen, it says, For God so loved the world, God loves the world. He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. Everyone thinks that Jesus came to tell everyone that they're condemned, but He came to save the world. I just wanted to, did you know that? I'm like, not like that. I did not know it like that. There's just something beautiful about that fresh faith and sometimes a crust of duty and cynicism forms like a callus on your heart. You need to get around young people who just pull that off and put you in touch with the raw love of Jesus. That's why you should volunteer in the student ministry of this church. I don't even know if they need more volunteers, but you're missing out if you're not helping. Anyway, the last thing I want to say is this. Um, You've got to determine in your heart that this will be the culture of your life and not a one-off event. A lot of Christians uh, get glory hungry. Because they fail to build a sustainable culture in their heart, they go chasing glory. Look what Albert Haas said. Because this is a gradual, ongoing process, we have to resist the temptation to look for a single book, program, practice, or guru guru that will cause spontaneous combustion. There are none. How many times have I been tricked into thinking that by reading the most recent book by a favorite author or practicing the latest spiritual craze, I'll become a saint? Catching fire takes patience and perseverance. It's hard, fatiguing work. It also requires a daily commitment to nurturing and tending the fire once it's started. And so, you, so I've got a fireplace, okay? It's amazing. I have a house in Pennsylvania. It's out in the woods. It's glorious. I bought it after 2008 when they were giving away homes, okay? Not quiet, but close. And, uh, oh, man, is there not something about a fire? Oh, so good. Like my, my dream state is like reading a book and drinking Americano and sit in front of the fire while Christy feeds me Chick-fil-A. Like that's like my dream life. <laughs> it's like, it's just like, be so strong. It's never happened, but it's this dream. <laughs> There's two ways you can build a fire. They've got these like cheapo logs It's like fake wood, okay? And you put it in and you light it and it lights super quick. It's designed to light quick. And so you light it in and like three minutes in, you're like, behold, this glorious fire that I've created. But it's such a quick fizzle. If you want to build a proper fire, it takes time. You've got to get the kindling. You've got to make sure that the wood is dry and you've got to add it and you've got to tend to it. But I'm telling you, four hours in when there is a bed of coals and you just put it in and it's filling the room, that's pure magic. A lot of people today have those spiritual like fire starter logs. I read this book and it's gonna fix everything. Great, I love to read. Uh, Jesus will fix everything. Man, I went to this conference. Man, let me tell you, I love a conference. A conference can be catalytic. But if you don't add fuel to it, it's just going to be a quick burn. Man, there's a, there's, a, there's a new thing. There's a new, yeah, great, man. I love all that stuff. But if you're not adding that on to the bonfire you've already built, it's just going to fizzle in the fire pit real quick. So you're going to learn over the course of time to build properly. Deep devotion, sustained devotion. And that takes a commitment to revel in His unfailing love. That's a different kind of life. Satan's number one plan is not to turn you into some great sinner. 
It's not to make you deconstruct and then write a blog about it. What a cliche. You know what his plan is for you? Just to keep you in lukewarm faith where you're never burning, but you, you never fall away. Here's what you become, irrelevant as an enemy of his. And here's God's plan for your life, to set your heart on fire. His desire for you is that within, regardless of what's happening, whether you're in a desert, whether you hate your job, or whether you're lonely or whatever it is, that you'll be able to say because of his love that his love is better than anything out there. And that you'll have within you joy unspeakable, full of glory. That you know this hope that, that just fills you with a kind of love and wonder that the world just can't find. Earnestly, we seek you. That's the key. It's got to be us together. One person can't hold out against a whole culture forever. You need brothers and sisters. And you don't know. You may think, man, I don't have much to offer. You don't know that your struggle, your story may not be the exact thing that somebody else needs. And you may come in in weakness and be like, oh, man, I don't know. I'm struggling. But like, here's this one thing God did for me. And that hits someone else's heart. And they're like, oh. Amazing how God does that. We need one another. That's what the Bible says. Do not forsake meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Why? So that we can spur one another on towards love and good deeds. And there's something beautiful about getting around our, our staff team. I get around some of them and I'm like, oh man, that's right. This thing's real and I need to go after it. There's something beautiful about stirring one another on. So look, we're, we're not handing out gold stars for church attendance. You don't get brownie points with God if you show up more. It's not about that. It's about let's be together. Let's help one another burn with passion for Jesus. My goal is that when I'm 75, 80 years old, that there will be such a bonfire of passion for Jesus in my heart that I have cultivated for 50 years of walking with Him that a lukewarm generation will say, let me get near you. I need to warm my heart. Come out from the cold and warm my heart at the fire of God's love in you. Don't you want a heart like that? That's the thing we're working on here. Cultivating love for Jesus. So God comes where he's wanted. Let's cultivate desire for him. Let's bow our hearts and, and just bring ourselves now into the presence of God. I say this quite a bit, but God cannot transform the person you're pretending to be you've got to be honest with him God can handle where you are and maybe you're here tonight you're like God my heart just feels dead well just tell him Lord it's dead he has a way of taking out the heart of stone and bringing your heart of flesh maybe you're in sin and you're, you're really not right with God and you're just realizing that it's not as good as you thought, but you're embarrassed and you're scared to come home. Just tell him, Father, I'm embarrassed. I'm scared to come home. And see if you don't see in your heart the Father coming for you. Maybe you're here and you're like, I'm on fire. Praise God. Thank you for stewarding your heart. Wherever you are from zero to 10 on your level of hunger for God. Just say, Lord, here's my heart. Would you just come and meet me? Give me a fresh encounter with your covenant love. Lord, I want to be able to say tomorrow when I'm looking at my coworkers who look like they had more fun than me, that your love is better than life. I want to say that because I walk with you that my soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. Lord, come and touch my heart. If Jesus was physically standing in front of you, if literally Jesus of the Bible was standing in front of you, what do you think he'd say to your heart? How do you think he'd respond? With your honesty, with your confession. Here's what he would do. He would pick you in his arms and he would hug you and he would say, mercy is yours. He would just say, I love you. Let's go. Don't worry about it. I forgive you. You're not forgotten. I understand. 
He wouldn't leave you where you are. He'd say, let's go on that journey, the journey of desire, that journey of love. He said, why don't you just receive his love right now? How do you receive love? You know, well, how do you receive a present at Christmas? Someone give you something? You put your hands out and you're like, thank you very much, I'll take that. Maybe you see to put your hands out and say, Jesus, I receive your love right now. Just let him give you his love. One of the most beautiful things in the Bible is Jesus touched people he could have healed simply by speaking to them to show them he cared. Maybe tonight you just need the touch of God to come, just touch you where you are to show you he cares. So Holy Spirit, we just want to pray right now that you would come and you would minister the love of Jesus, our bridegroom, to your sons and daughters. Father, I just pray for those who are hurting and they're just sort of beat to hell and it's just been so hard and such a struggle and they're so demoralized and discouraged. I just pray that the power and hope and encouragement of your spirit would fill their spirits right now. Lord, I literally pray like someone pouring a cup of water this would happen into their hearts. They would literally feel your presence filling them right now with love. Come Holy Spirit, pour out the liquid love of God. Lord, your word says that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and fill those who need love. Maybe you're angry at someone or you're bitter about something and it's consuming all of your passion and all your energy. Just ask God for help. Help me to forgive. Jesus, I just pray that you would just put power to forgive inside people's hearts tonight. And Lord, we want to be people who say, God, you are our God. Earnestly we seek you. Our whole being longs for you in the desert of sin and secularism that is this city. And I just pray, Lord God, that this would be a community of people who are cultivating hunger and love for you. And so, Lord, we pray that you will receive our worship even now. We offer our hearts to you and pray that you would come and meet us. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Folks, we're going to respond in worship tonight. Worship in the Greek is an interesting word. It has a, a wide semantic range. But one of the ideas of worship means to kiss. To kiss. And I don't think many of us, when we think of worship, we think of duty. We think of singing. Maybe we think of putting our hands up. Well, maybe you consciously think of not putting your hands up. But this is just a response of love. In the most reverent way possible, worship is a little bit of like, bring it in. Bring it in to kiss, to worship, to love, to celebrate. You see men, stoic men, bored in church, cold-hearted, lukewarm, at a football game, come on! Painting their faces, taking their shirts off when completely inappropriate, painting their bodies, distorted godless colours, like free children in church. No, that's not it. All for a movement of people for, who see God for who He is whose response is just one of love. It's just a passionate, wholehearted response of love. So tonight, maybe your response is to worship for the first time with all your heart. Like, come on, God, bring it in. I'm gonna respond with all of my heart. So let's stand together and let's ask God to come and meet us and to cultivate love and passion for Him. We also have a prayer team that's here. If you need prayer for anything, they'd love to be able to pray for you. And uh, anything happening in your life, maybe you just want to mark a moment, maybe you're struggling with something, maybe you need healing. Anything at all we can do to, to care for you, pray for you, please, we'd love to just invite you to come forward and receive prayer. So let's press in in response together.